Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is April 3rd, 2022, and the U.S. state of California has a task force on reparations for descendants of slaves. In this video, we're going to take a look at some coverage of that, including an article from Cal Matters and a video from Tim Black TV, a YouTube channel which qualifies for me as part of the Sock Dem Gang. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So let's start with the article from Cal Matters. This is by Lil Kalish, dated March 30, 2022, very current. Title is California Task Force, Reparations for Direct Descendants of Enslaved People Only. In summary, California's first in the nation task force to identify reparations for African Americans voted Tuesday to limit eligibility to those who can trace their lineage. After more than six hours of debate Tuesday, California's Reparations Task Force voted that only black Californians who can prove a direct lineage to enslaved ancestors will be eligible for the statewide and first in the nation initiative to address the harms and enduring legacy of slavery. The nine-member task force voted five to four, so very close vote in favor of defining eligibility for reparations based on lineage, quote, determined by an individual being an African-American descendant of a chattel enslaved person or the descendant of a free black person living in the U.S. prior to the end of the 19th century, the motion read. An earlier amendment to the motion pushed for a broader definition of eligibility that would have included all 2.6 million African-Americans in California with, quote, special consideration for those with direct lineage to enslaved persons. That amendment failed. So commenting, just to recap, this is determined by an individual being an African-American descendant of a chattel enslaved person. So I find that sort of strange wording. Obviously, we know that chattel slavery was done in the days when there was chattel slavery on the basis of people being from Africa. Of course, having been brought to the United States forcibly against their will, etc. So that's the basis of slavery. However, the phrase African-American descendant really is describing the descendant today in 2022, many generations later. So hopefully there aren't qualifications on, you know, whether the family diverged or not at some point from being purely African. There are a lot of mixed race people in the United States who do have enslaved ancestors. Anyway, part two, or the descendant of a free black person living in the United States prior to the end of the 19th century. So basically 1900 or 1899 being the cutoff. So basically, if you are black, but your ancestors came to the United States after 1900, you do not qualify. So anyway, that's my understanding and my questions about this so far. Also, again, there was the amendment, the earlier amendment that did not pass, that was going to be for all 2.6 million African Americans in California, then with, quote, special consideration for those with direct lineage to enslaved people. All right, let's continue. Two years ago, Governor Gavin Newsom signed legislation giving, quote, special consideration to black Americans who are direct descendants of enslaved people. Authored by former Assembly member Shirley Weber, now the California Secretary of State, the bill also established a two-year reparations task force to study and develop a plan on what reparations might look like. The task force is expected to release a reparations proposal in June 2023 with recommendations for the legislature. So they've got over a year to come up with a proposal for the legislature. That's a long time. Continuing. While the scope of reparations will be determined in the coming months, many task force members said that they expect cash payments to be one part of the proposal, as well as a formal apology. The task force said that this eligibility determination will help economists tasked with quantifying the amount of reparations owed. This vote establishes that going forward, only those black Californians who are able to trace their lineage back to enslaved ancestors will be eligible for the state's reparations. Other black Californians, such as black immigrants, will not be eligible. Camilla Moore, 
task force chairperson, said that not going with a lineage-based approach would, quote, aggrieve the victims of slavery. Others, like Los Angeles-based civil rights lawyer Lisa Holder, argued against a strict lineage approach. Quote, we must make sure that we include present day and future harms, Holder said. Quote, the system that folks are advocating for here, where we splice things up, where only one small slice benefits, will not abate the harms of racism, unquote. Cheryl Grills, a committee member and a clinical psychologist at Loyola Marymount University, also said that a lineage-based approach would be, quote, divisive and, quote, another win for white supremacy. Don Tamaki, the only non-black member of the reparations task force, said that during the Japanese-American redress movement, which fought reparations and an apology for Japanese internment during World War II, organizers faced similar questions about determining eligibility. Quote, it's rough justice, Tamaki said. Quote, we had to exclude groups too within our community. Practical and very difficult decisions were made, unquote. So commenting, that quote to me kind of sounded like he was, you know, giving a sort of reason or excuse for this vote. So I wanted to look up, you know, this was a five to four vote. Was the only non-black member of the reparations task force the deciding vote? That would just be sort of an interesting situation. However, uh, Tamaki abstained during the first couple of rounds of voting uh, and then voted on the just doing it by race side. The tie-breaking vote was not by Tamaki. All right, continuing. Today's decision will mean that a fraction of the state's 2.6 million black residents, who make up 6.5% of the population, will benefit from reparations. While black people are a minority in the state, they are overrepresented in the state's carceral system, with black men making up 28.5% of the state's prison population and nearly 40% of the state's unhoused population. Let's just stop for a minute. I'm going to read that again. There are 2.6 million black residents of California, 6.5% of the population. However, black men are 28.5% of the prison population. That is fourfold overrepresentation, almost four and a half. As for being 6.5% of the population, but 40% of the state's unhoused population, that is more than sixfold overrepresentation. So you tell me, is this individual failings? Is this a racist system? Obviously, it's a racist system, one that extends back across time. It's never not been a racist system. And these are just two examples of it. By the way, remember this about the unhoused population when we do the housing crisis video coming up. That's going to be looking at a guest on the Joe Rogan show, but that's for later. Continuing. Excluded will be black immigrants in California, many of whom came from East and West Africa and the Caribbean and make up roughly 178,000 people, according to 2014 data from the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Tuesday's task force also heard from 10 genealogists about why a lineage-based model is significant and how individuals might go about establishing their relationship with enslaved ancestors. Now, they're about to get into that, but that's a lot of work. Also considering that, you know, freed slaves, could they read? Not necessarily. Could they write? Not necessarily. Are the records going to be great? Not necessarily. Remember, the cutoff time is 1900. That was an incredibly long time ago. And then slavery ended even earlier than that. Difficult to trace back records. I mean, you know, in my own case, I remember, like, I tried to get my medical records from not that long ago. Turned out they were wiped out in a flood. I shit you not. So call me skeptical that this is going to be super easy. Anyway, continuing. Evelyn McDowell the chairperson of the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage, said that it is, quote, absolutely possible for black Californians to trace their lineage by determining the birth year of a great or great-great-grandparent in the South, and that would likely be sufficient evidence for eligibility. Let's pause there. I would really like more explanation of that, because let's take a generation as 25 years, say. So it's 2022, 
Let's start with somebody who is 27 years old, born in 1995. So the parents were born 1970, their parents born in 1945. Their parents, who would be the great-grandparents, would have been born in 1920. That's 20 years after the deadline, the cutoff point for immigration, 1900. So going back even further to the great-great-grandparent, that's 1895. So we're still well after, like a generation after the end of slavery. So, I don't know, just call me skeptical that this is going to be easy to prove. And also, I don't exactly see the connection between a great or great-great-grandparent. So, anyway, you know, I guess it comes down to, in the end, how lenient the supervising authorities who are actually approving these claims are going to be. I don't know that Evelyn McDowell is personally going to be authorizing the claims, so... I don't really know where that statement comes from, I guess. So, personally, I, I wouldn't uh, take that much comfort in that at this point. I would need to see more evidence for that. Anyway, continuing. Other genealogists, such as Hollis Gentry, also support a lineage-based approach, but Gentry cautions that this process will be time-consuming and costly and suggests enlisting public, state, and private libraries for assistance. So commenting, I also think it will be very time-consuming and costly. Probably most of the people who'd be most interested in this have neither time nor money to spend on it. I mean, unless that's going to be compensated, you know, by the program, like, are, are you going to wind up spending the amount of money that you'd be getting back in the check on doing this research? And then how much time and money are people going to spend only to find out they can't go back further than three or four generations? So, I mean, this kind of raises the question for people who work in the field of genealogy. Um, you know, right now, what's the average that a person can go back? What percentage of people are not expected to qualify to be able to do this? Because the records simply don't exist. You know, genealogists, people who spend their time, they're involved in this research on a professional basis. I mean, should have some idea of like how far back the records go, what percentage of people can actually access those records, etc. So, you know, how many people is this going to exclude just off the bat? Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but let's just raise the point now. Uh, and there are going to be a, a few more criticisms, quotes from experts in the field. Can capitalism, basically the same system that perpetrated these injustices, really provide adequate reparations, adequate redress of the harm that the system caused. So, in, you know, putting on my Marxist hat here, this is a problem that capitalism created, and I don't think it really can solve it. Trying to view how do we right the wrongs of slavery through the lens of we have to do it within capitalism. I think that you're, you know, out of the gate really keeping too low of a ceiling on what's possible. So if the end result winds up being far insufficient and, you know, many people feel that way, it's an important thing to point out is that you're asking the system that did this. And, you know, speaking of California, the same system that refuses consistently to even put Medicare for all, even on the state level, up for a vote, for example, we're going to right the wrongs of slavery now in 2022 after... All this time has passed that nobody has, you know, felt a need to do any of this before. No, I think that you need a new system. We need to move beyond capitalism. And then we can address this and all kinds of other problems because we're no longer working then within the confines of the ruling class that has been lording over all of us this whole time. Anyway, let's continue. Jessica Awior, the founder of the National Black Cultural Information Trust, also warns against methods of establishing lineage that are quote, invasive, such as DNA testing, and worries that those with limited access to technology and those with disabilities may have trouble participating. Last month, Erwin Chemerinsky, the dean of UC Berkeley's law school, testified that establishing lineage in a, quote, race-neutral fashion is less likely to be struck down by the courts. Many people that called in for public comment who identified themselves as direct descendants of chattel slavery 
also supported this approach. Over the last 10 months, the task force has discussed how the legacy of Jim Crow laws, redlining, and housing discrimination, police brutality, environmental racism. So that's where the members of a specially oppressed racial group get to live in the polluted part of town or the polluted part of the county or whatever it is, continuing. And many other factors have led to systemic discrimination towards black people in California. Though California joined the Union as a free state under the Compromise of 1850, the state's fugitive slave law allowed enslaved people to remain under bondage as long as they were later deported to the South. So that's the end of the article. There are many articles written on this, each of which, like, it'll cover a lot of the same quotes, but each one gives, like, a slightly different spin and a new nugget of information. I would encourage you to look this up and do additional reading on it because you're going to find, you know, this or that tidbit that's going to enhance the discussion. But I wanted to at least cover the basics in at least one article prior to getting into the Tim Black video, which in typical hanging with the sock dem critique fashion, I have not watched previously. I'll be watching it cold. So anyway, let's get into that now, now that we have some background information on what happened in California. Speaking of bills, there's another bill that's going on in California. Something monumental is happening. There's a task force in California. California Task Force on Reparations reaches its first hurdle. AB 3121, Task Force to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans. That's right, folks. It's an assembly bill in California to basically do what H.R. Ford is supposed to do on the federal level, which is to take a look at and study and develop a proposals or proposals for African Americans reparations. Well, there is a, an important update. There was a motion carried today to define the community of eligibility based on lineage determined by an individual being an African American descendant of a chattel or slave person or the descendant of a free black person living in the U.S. prior to the end of the 19th century. This is important, not a lot of by, by popular demand. By a number of black folks, a lot of activists, a lot of concerned individuals who say that the racial wealth gap is not just something that just happens. It's no amount of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps when you don't even have shoes. That phrase, pull yourself by your, up by your bootstraps, was coined back in the early 1800s. It was supposed to be a joke, not a literal thing. It's not, a, it's not even possible. It was a joke. It's an ironic uh, oxymoronish, I don't know, type of quote. Wasn't it supposed to be taken literal. You weren't supposed to literally say it. To say it was to be facetious, to be a jackass. Put yourself up by your bootstraps. The motion that was passed had some contentious moments, folks. There are people who are saying, hey, if you only make this for descendants of slaves, what about everyone who came here after slavery? Who couldn't catch a cab? who cops pulled over, who was discriminated against in housing or, or whatever, just regular life. What about all those people? And look, I want to say, I've, I've had guests on this show who have argued this, who've argued that discrimination, if you come to America and you are black, you look black, you get treated like black people. You look black, you get treated like black. That's it. So I understand the argument, and I know that there are folks who believe that. And, think, and, and I want to step out. I want to say, all discrimination is wrong. I don't support discrimination for any person, anybody. I don't support it. But to pretend that black Americans, descendants of slavery in this country, haven't gotten a very special blend of discrimination, to pretend it's not been very specific and very uh, organic to this country and very unique compared to others. Well, that, that would be being dishonest. Totally dishonest. You know. You know it's the difference between being Irish and being black. You know it's the difference between being black and being Asian. Let's ask your, let's ask your credit scores. 
That's as your net wealth. So these are the things we got to deal with. And we got to deal with it because it's America. Not you personally, but it's America. So. Okay, I'm going to pause here. Sort of a natural break. And uh, I think that Tim Black so far has just raised good questions and only good questions. And let me say also, I've said it in other videos, so I sometimes forget to point this out, but I'm not forgetting here. Uh, I'm not black. So I am here in a support capacity only. I am here for black U.S. Americans to take steps along the road to justice, which I believe all those roads lead to socialism eventually. I'm here to support, to elevate and amplify not to cut down, not to obstruct, not to stand in the way. Just want to be clear about that. So two specific things that Tim Black pointed out here. Uh, issue one, you look black, you get treated as black in the United States. You know, most of the forms of racism, they don't stop and ask, did you have a descendant who was enslaved? It's you're black. So the foundations of that racism may have a lot to do with the historic you know, practice of race-based chattel slavery in the country. But now, the legacy of that is not directly based on who was, you know, related to a slave, who came here after. It just became part of the overall racialized hierarchy of the oppressed working class in the United States. And Tim Black makes a very good point. There are very specific harms of being black in the USA. Yes, for example, Catholics would be oppressed in relation to Protestants or the Irish. You know, there would be periods of time where they would just say Irish need not apply in certain eastern cities in the job ads. Overall, though, the whole thing of, you know, the construction of the, quote, white race and who qualifies for membership in the white race, which, by the way, entirely hinges off of how many people do the ruling class need to be in that, quote, white category. Like, at a time, Italians were not considered white than they were when the ruling class needed more, quote, whites. So that whole thing. But, uh, yeah, being black, it's a very specific status. You know, the particular conditions of the United States were, for one, it was a massive land grab of, you know, just this is a situation that did not exist in Europe. You know, for example, in Marxism, when we talk about the progression from the slave state to feudalism to capitalism. In a certain sense, the United States was the first bourgeois republic that you know, didn't have this feudalist past, or it was just sort of a colony of a feudal, you know, semi-monarchist, semi-capitalist power in England. So, yes, the founding of the United States did sort of conform to the overall you know, thing of capitalism follows feudalism. But, for example, uh, this clip started off with a flag that says California Republic. Now, did the California Republic emerge after overthrowing the California feudal state? No, it did not. No, it did not. It was established on land that was occupied by indigenous nations. So, yes, the founding of that California Republic, it was a bourgeois republic ruled by capitalists, that stemmed off of and was supported by the government in Washington, D.C., which, yes, was established by overthrowing the king. But this whole, you know, manifest destiny concept, all of that land grab, this is a very unique thing. And the reason that I laughed before is, you know, it wasn't just like the, uh, you know, struggle for capitalism in the United States on the, you know, the Americas today. This wasn't just a struggle against feudalism. It was a genocidal conquest. So when we're talking about the special conditions of the United States, which is the point of this whole sort of sidebar, is that, first of all, the first sort of element of racial oppression is the indigenous nations, Native Americans. The country was literally geographically built on the foundation of genocide of indigenous nations. Like that's where the land that constitutes the California Republic, that territory, that's where that came from. It wasn't won from a king. It was done by steamrolling over the people who already lived there, who were not part of that feudalism versus capitalism dialectic that the United States Project broke off of 
back in Europe. So those were victims of U.S. expansionism. Very particular kind of oppression there by the United States system. Then, I would say the next level up above that, you have an entire nation of people imported from Africa against their will, forcibly. Absolutely horrible process. Um, and they didn't necessarily come directly over. Uh, they were sometimes put through really horrendous underground prison systems and things to break their spirits first. Like the process of importing people from Africa to the United States uh, to become slaves was an absolutely horrific process. Maybe we'll get into that at some point. But here again, you have a set of conditions where it's not just like, oh, people came from this part of the world and people treated them a certain way and people came from this part. No, these people were brought against their will, completely against their will, and then treated as literal property, not people, not as really members of the society. So even in the 1860s, where you formally, legally change that distinction, I mean, the roots of that in the culture, in the fabric of the country, don't just go away. So that's some of what, you know, the efforts to address this lingering wound of slavery that is just a part of U.S. history that still has not been adequately treated. And again, I think that, you know, whatever can be gained under capitalism is good, and I'm here to support that. I also am throwing out there for people who do want this justice, uh, look into, you know, what you get under capitalism probably isn't going to be the last stage. You are probably going to need socialism for that. Again, though, I'm here to support everything we can get under capitalism in the meantime. But yeah, Tim Black is absolutely correct. Being black is not like being Irish. And disclaimer, I am part Irish. So I know. I don't uh, get treated like black people get treated in the United States. That's an absurd thought. I would never say that. People who do are lying to you. They're trying to mislead. And basically, they're opponents of racial justice. So that's not to say that nothing bad ever happened to Irish Americans. That's not to say even things that should be apologized for or corrected have never happened to Irish Americans in U.S. history. But that's an entirely separate discussion that isn't anywhere near on the same level of what we're talking about with reparations for slavery, racialized chattel slavery. Totally different thing, totally different legacy. Let's go back to the clip. I've also had people on the show like Dr. Derek, Derek Hamilton, uh, Dr. Sandy Darity, Dr. Elwood, uh, Elwood Watson, a lot of professors. Huh? I'm getting professors on this show to discuss these issues. It's not just Tim Black talking, you know, with emotions. I've had actual professors who have spent large amounts of their time studying these issues, and they came to share their thoughts with you. And, and I support this. I support this focused. Does it mean? that others can't, can't seek restitution for their own grievances. Doesn't mean that at all. This means that this is a unique grievance to a unique people in a very unique way over an extended period of time have, have, have endured some things that have shaped and and produce the America that we now have. And I think that's important for us to acknowledge that. Now, here's the thing, and this is the reason why I wanted to go right behind this one bill, the bill, the anti-lynching bill. It took 120 years for us to even pass a federal, to make lynching black people, well, I guess this is not just black people, this is anyone. This anti-lynching bill applies to all folks who are lynched. The fact that we consider it only black people is just goes to show how discriminated against and, and terrorized black people have been. Because when you think of lynching, do you think of anyone else? No. But it's not a black bill. It's not, it's not a black law. It's an American law that protects all Americans from being lynched. And making that a special designation as a hate crime. But it took 120 years for us to get there. How long would it take us to get there with reparations? We couldn't even get them to say, hey, it's even with Demet Till. 
being lynched in front of the world and it being on magazine covers such as Jet Magazine. In 1955, it still took another, what, 70 years? So what does today's motion in the task force mean? It means that lineage matters. It means you're going to need to trace, be able to trace back your lineage or your ancestors to someone who was formerly enslaved in the United States. That's all. It's the starting point. And, that, and I, I, I agree with it. I saw this on Twitter, and I was kind of surprised. Rachel Dolezal was asked this exact question. We still haven't had reparations. We still haven't had like this healing, truth and reconciliation. Kind of if we had reparations, would you begin to check? No, I'm not. I don't. Rep I don't actually identify as African American. I identify as black. Like, would somebody who moved here from Nigeria get a check? No. There's a Pan African diaspora, so I'm part of the Pan. We all go back to Africa. We all have a black mother eventually. I know it's her, but um, it doesn't mean she's wrong, though. She's right. She ain't wrong, though. She ain't wrong, though. She's right. I know it's Rachel Dolezal, but um, she ain't wrong. Hit me up at Real Tim Black on Facebook and Twitter. Hit me up at Tim Black and that on Instagram. Click up top to go see a video about the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill. All right, so that's the end of the clip, ending on kind of a lighter note there. So Tim Black makes more good points in here. I think that it's not entirely clear about one thing, but he makes the point that people have endured things that have produced the America that we now have, and this bill would address some of that. It's not clear to me if uh, Tim Black supports the lineage thing as the best possible thing, at least from this clip. So, I mean, that was what the vote was on. It was, you know, five to four for lineage versus race. Or whether he just supports it over nothing. Like, this is a step forward. Something is better than nothing in this case. I do think that it's in the interest of everyone who even, you know, would be benefiting from this to, you know, just interrogate, like, can you get any more out of it? In other words, some of the questions I was raising before, is it really going to be feasible for people to prove this lineage and actually get the benefits that this bill would be, you know, extending to them? Um, so, you know, I would just encourage that. Get as much as you possibly can out of it, you know, and don't let things slip through that otherwise, you know, could be interrogated a bit more, stretched further for the benefit of more people so that the people who this bill says that it's going to help actually does help. So anyway, that's what I'd say. So yeah, it's not clear whether he thinks that the lineage is better than the race or just supports it over nothing. Either way, I agree that I think it is a step forward, particularly in a country that is so racist that it took over a hundred years to get the anti-lynching bill. And Tim Black makes a very good point there that you know, lynching is not a black specific thing. Other people, other groups have been targeted to be victims of lynching, but black people most often, and so that's who it gets identified with, and hence it is, you know, a kind of law that the racist system is very hesitant to do anything about because hey, the people in power kind of benefit, they kind of encourage that sort of behavior. So it takes a hundred years to get a law passed to protect, I mean, really anybody technically can be a target of lynching, but most often it's black people. So it drops down the priority list of a racist system that needs white vigilantes to terrorize and oppress black people because the state can't do it all itself. You know, just the other night, I was watching the movie Zodiac from the 2000s with Jake Gyllenhaal. It's about the Zodiac killer. You know, that case was never solved. And it becomes clear, yeah, there are technological limitations of like, you know, they didn't have faxes or some of, only some of them had faxes and stuff like that. And the police departments didn't share information and all this. But you can kind of look at it from a somewhat different angle also, which is that police are actually really good 
at terrorizing racial minorities, especially oppressed groups within the working class, they're not so good at, like, solving actual crime. Almost like that's kind of not their purpose. It's just protecting private property and being an internal army there to just support the rule of capital. In other words, it's all about priorities. Why did it take 100 years to get an anti-lynching bill that primarily black people benefit from because it's a hate crime? Why did it take this long to even get one single state having a reparation task force? Systemic racism is the answer. It's part of the U.S. system of capitalism. The intertwined racism throughout U.S. capitalism is part of the support and reinforcement of U.S. capitalism. It's part of why it's so resilient. So anyway, uh, I'm going to end the video here. This is a story it will be ongoing for quite a while, as this task force is certainly going to take its time. Uh, but we'll try to update this and look for other critical and radical points of view on this whole thing. And again, you know, the main insight that I would attempt to add to this whole conversation is you're only going to get so far under capitalism with this. I totally support every effort to make the most of that. And I just hope and encourage that anti-racist activists and specifically pro-reparations activists see, as I think it's likely, that capitalism is only going to grant so much on this question. I mean, it's already been how much time, how much foot dragging, what actually comes out of it in the end, that to really get better closure on this, probably going beyond capitalism entirely, is necessary. And we'll be there to work together. All right, what do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion in the comment section as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening. And thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging. They are also materially helpful. They've allowed me to produce more content than I would have been able to do without the support. So I really value it. I don't take it for granted at all. Also helpful to the channel is support in the way of engagement, clicks, likes, comments, sharing on your social media, subscribing to the channel. All of that helps to boost S4A in the YouTube algorithm. It makes this content easier for people who haven't seen it before to stumble across it. You know, a lot of people are walking around with a lot of questions about society, the economy, why are things so hard, etc. And we're trying to make it easier for them to stumble across this content and to get those answers. Your financial support makes it more likely because it lets me do more videos. And your support through engagement makes it more likely by helping to boost the videos and spread them around. So thanks to everyone for that, and we will catch you in the next video.